You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. In, in 1994, Damien Eccles, Jesse Miss Kelly, and Jason Baldwin were convicted of murdering three eight-year-old boys named Michael Moore, Christopher Byers, and Stevie Branch in 2011. The killers were freed after pleading guilty via an Alford plea, promising to fight to fully exonerate themselves from the outside. The killers did little until 2021 when they began to petition the courts to test the DNA evidence. Joining me to discuss the West Memphis Three's long history with DNA and public relations is friend to the show, Jennifer Carlson, and also an incredible expert on this case. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, Roberta. Good to be here. So what got you interested in the West Memphis Three case? Um, when the Paradise Lost documentary came out, um, I remember uh, watching particularly the opening scene, which is just jarring. And um, I've been obsessed with the case ever since. I mean, um, especially after their release, I, um, I really, it really upset me when they were released. And um, I really had to dig in deep to make sure that my instincts um, weren't leading me the wrong way. Yeah. So you're talking about that opening of Paradise Lost where mo- mothers are feigning and and it kind of goes through the town and the town's reaction. Is that, is it, that? It's, it's the, the opening scene where they're at the crime scene and they show the boys on the ditch okay. bank. It's just okay. jarring. Okay. You don't forget I, it I when you see it. it. <laughs> I haven't seen it in quite, quite some time. Yeah. yeah. It, they, it had such an impression uh, of so many people. And I think such a connection to the killers it creates. What, when, what most people believe about the West Memphis Three is that they were exonerated by DNA evidence that matched a stepfather. Up, to, up until then, they had been pointing the fingers at one stepfather, John Mark Byers. But what they announced was that they had found exonerating DNA evidence that matched a new stepfather, Terry Hobbs, and it was found in the laces of the shoes, and the state offered them the Alfred plea just guilty plea and they took it. Is that what happened? Not exactly. Um, with the, the hair that was found um, is not even a match to Terry Hobbs. Um, so they had, they had done some DNA testing um, a while back and um, they had found that one of the hairs that was in one of the ligatures that was on Michael Moore they say was a match to Terry Hobbs. Um, however, um, it's not exactly a match. Um, I wouldn't even say it's it's entirely consistent with it. Um, the report actually says that Hobbs is not excluded. Um, the this, this sequence, the DNA sequence, so they're using mtDNA, which um, basically is the maternal line. It's not as accurate as nuclear str dna so um, this has an additional polymorphism um, that so terry hobbs's hair or dna has an additional polymorphism that the ligature t- hair does not have um, so they're claiming it the difference may be due to something called heteroplasmy which i'm not an expert in but because of that they're saying he cannot be excluded. So there's a big difference between there's a match and he cannot be excluded. And even even they're saying he can't be excluded, they're saying there it may be due to heteroplasmy. So they don't even know that for sure. So to say that's Terry Hobbs's hair in the ligature that was used to tie 
Michael Moore would be not accurate, in my how opinion. Many, how many people could be included in that group with Terry Hobbs? Oh, um, let's see. I would say, I mean, it's, it's a huge amount of people. Um, like, like, uh, millions, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, that part, that's hardly the kind of one on one DNA. We think of that kind of DNA match. Yeah. Like it's impossible one to in do a billion that chance. Right. With hair, unless the hair has the root on it, then you can do it. But, but not in this case. And in this case, like I said, there is a, a difference that they're excusing um, by saying it may be due to the heteroplasmy. So it doesn't even, it doesn't even match. So if the West Memphis three claim that this, this was exonerating evidence, why didn't they go to trial with it? And why are they asking for new testing now? If, if the, if that hair kind of exonerated them back in 2011? Well, I mean, the simple answer is because it doesn't exonerate them. It didn't then, it doesn't now. Um, and I don't know if DNA can exonerate them at this point. I don't know if that's even possible, even if they were innocent, which I don't believe. But if they were, um, your lack of DNA at a crime scene would only be significant if um, they found DNA of somebody whose DNA shouldn't be there, um, who maybe had a history of this type of crime, which doesn't exist because there is no crime like this. This is a one of a kind crime, it, from what I can we tell. Can't. I've never, I've ne never been able to find another case. Not to say that they don't exist, but I have never been able to find one where. Up there, you know, if they're saying a parent or a step parent kills a child, I've never been able to find one where they did that and killed the child's two friends along with them. I've never heard of it. It's unheard of. I mean, it's possible there could be a case out there somewhere. I've never been able to find one. Me either. And and also, I believe that their own lawyer called their exonerating stepfather. Evident, DNA evidence, which is this kind of more general DNA, uh, weak evidence. So mm -hmm. not 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 something you can really go and and stake your your claim of exoneration on. But they did in the media. So what what are they what are they asking for to be tested, and what is it in fact testing? So. So currently they are asking for the ligatures used. So the boys were um, tied, their hands were tied, um, right hand to right ankle, left hand to left ankle with their own shoelaces. Um, and so they're asking to test those shoelaces that were used as ligatures um, for using the MVAC system, which is wasn't available at the time um, back in 1994 or 93. Um, and the MVAC, what it is, is it, um, it's kind of the, the, the basic way to describe it is it's kind of like a carpet cleaner or something like that, or a carpet shampoo, where it sprays um, liquid, I'm not sure what kind, and it sucks it up at the same time. So um, and the MVAC system is supposed to be able to pull more DNA than any other method um, but there's a problem with that, and that is that it's also destructive. So it's also going to destroy anything else that is left on the shoelaces. Um, it's going, it's not, you're not going to be able to test them for DNA again after that. So what I hear is that you have like a one shot, one shot at it with MVAC. Once you've MVAC a piece of evidence, it's gone. You can't test it again. That's that correct. Right? Yep. And it's also extremely sensitive. So not only is it capable of pulling potentially, um, now the, the boys were found in the water as well. So they were in the water overnight as with, you know, the shoelaces. 
everything was in the water overnight. So that is really damaging to DNA. And so it's going to pull, it could potentially pull any um, DNA of the killer, but also anybody who has ever handled the shoelaces. Um, these are eight-year-old boys that were murdered. And um, any number of people could have tied these shoelaces at any time, um, including the people who put originally put them in the shoes when they were in the store. Um, I mean, so, so it could potentially pull, you know, maybe, you know, as much as 10, 20 different mixtures of DNA off of these laces and they could claim, oh, it's exonerating. <laughs> you know what I mean? But whose right. DNA is that? It, is it the dad, the mom and dad? So they're helping him tie the shoes. Did his friend help him tie the shoe? You know, how many people help young kids tie their shoes? Right. Good I would say point. a lot. They're teachers. Could it pull up something like if someone, I, I don't know how much you know. I mean, this may be going past what you know. That's okay. But just... If you if you were say someone's threw a cigarette butt, it, would that pick up if it, it were in the water near them? Would that pick up on on their clothing? Does it have to be touched? DNA. Wait, you know? wait, wait, wait. You're, what you're saying? Mean, I mean, if we were in the water, you throw a cigarette butt in the water. Is that would that DNA possibly show up on their clothes? I'm just saying, could it float through the water? I be, wouldn't think yeah. so. Okay. <laughs> I would, I mean, but it, I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert, but that'd be my best guess is it is okay. like a, a cigarette butt floating in the water wouldn't be able to transfer to their clothes unless it touched it potentially. Okay. Would be my best guess. Yeah. I've just used to, t I, I'm, this is not my area of expertise at all. I'm so glad you're here to explain it all. And so the West Memphis three were released in 2000, August, on August 19th, 2011, why did they wait for 10 years to ask for this kind of testing? And originally we heard that it had all been destroyed. What was, why are they only asking for these shoelaces to be tested and nothing else? Um, that I can't figure out because there's many other things that could be tested. If they're going to do this MVAC testing, I would prefer, and I know a lot of other people, some who believe they're innocent and some who believe they're guilty would prefer to have everything tested with MVAC if they're going to do it um, because there's so many other things they could test um, the boys clothing because um, their clothing was torn off of their bodies or, or pulled off of their bodies by the killers um, would be a good thing to test with MVAC, but they're not asking for that, which is strange because I would think that would be, um, is more valuable maybe even than the shoelaces because it's bigger. There's more area that they can vacuum. Absolutely. But they always seem to ask, the at least the Innocence Project and Innocence Project lawyers, I've noticed always seem to ask for ties. And I've always yeah. wondered if there was something about ties that seem like they would have a lot of DNA and that they often don't. I, that's just my own curiosity, but the West Memphis three have a long history of DNA. We're going to take a quick break. When we get back from the break, Jennifer's going to go through starting in 1993 with a necklace. Stay tuned. If you are enjoying this episode of my true crime report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. You wouldn't want to think that this was a DNA case. The boys were found in the water but the West Memphis Three have asked for DNA testing since the early days of this case. Can you talk a little bit about the history of the DNA testing in this case? Yes. Yeah. So originally um, in 1993, DNA was at the very beginning stages of how they would, of them using it in criminal cases. Um, so there, there wasn't, 
you couldn't get too specific on the matches. It was very close to being like a blood type thing where there's only one, there's only one, um, they call it a, a HLA DQ or, and, and it's basically a series of numbers. Um, so it was in some, a lot of people in the case matched each other. And so it made things in the beginning, very complicated. Um, there was blood on Jesse Miss Kelly's shirt um, and they tested it and it came back as a match to one of the victims, uh, Michael Moore. However, it also was a match to Jesse Miss Kelly. Um, so that was, they couldn't use that for anything. Um, there was a necklace um, that was worn by Damien Eccles um, that had blood on it. And that came back as a match to Stevie Branch. However, it also matched Jason Baldwin, um, who was Damien's best friend, uh, one of the three uh, convicted killers. Um, so they couldn't use that because they had the same type of HLADQ -E um, DNA uh, locus. So, and then I think there was... One more thing. Um, John Mark Byers gave a, a a knife to one of the HBO crew members when they were filming the documentary, and there was blood on that. And so they asked to have that tested, and that matched um, Christopher Byers, one of the victims, but it also matched John Mark Byers. Um, so that was useless. And they made um, so much of that knife. They were like, see, he's the real killer. You yeah, know, that they, was the whole point of a point they, of season two of Paradise yes, Lost. I was gonna you know, say they they, they made that the whole point. <laughs> yeah, they made that the whole focus of Paradise Lost Two was John Mark Byers was this evil, crazy person um who murdered his stepson and friends, but but nope. They had me totally duped. <laughs> they had to switch they had to switch to a different stepfather because that wasn't working. <laughs> Uh, even then, um, I was like, so uh, so after the necklace, what happened in the 2000s with the DNA testing? Um, I don't know that much happened um, until they did it. Oh, they did it in uh, 2005. They started testing for, for actual STR DNA. They did a lot of hair testing, which is the MT DNA as well. And they tested so many items. Um, in December of 2005, they had all of these items tested. They, they went back January of 2007. So, so we're talking over a year later, right? They, they are comparing it to the three killers that are in prison at this point. Um, they've been in prison for what, over 10 years at this point when this happened. And, they got all these different results and they'll tell you that they, there's none of their DNA in any of these items, um, which technically that may be true, but it's not exactly true um, because they, they're excluded. The only things they're excluded from, let me, let me, so 20, 29 items um, had no results at all. So they're not excluded from those 29 items. And then four four items couldn't exclude any but any male, so they're not excluded from those. Five items couldn't exclude um, anyone. Five additional items, so they're not excluded from that. Um, so there's 21 items that exclude the the three convicted child killers. 21 items, but each one of those 21 items listed on this uh, lab report match the victims not a single one that excludes them doesn't match the victims on this 2007 report wait say that again so how many so 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 two there's two items that could match them DNA no they, there's there's um 38 out of all of these items tested uh -huh. that that did not exclude them so it does it's it's not that they're it matches them but it doesn't exclude them because there there wasn't enough information 
Um, it's only a partial profile, so they can't say whether or not it excludes them um, or so things like that. They but, got no, no, nothing on it, or they can't be excluded, and they right. they can't right. And the it's only not thing to include them, yeah, right? Or, the only. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not enough. Else, right? Yes, it's not enough to 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 say it's them. Um, but the twenty one items that, that that do exclude them all matched the the victims, the boys who were killed. Interesting. Um, on this particular report, which is the biggest batch of DNA testing that was done in the case by which far. Which you would think it would scare them away from wanting to keep up with this DNA testing, but. No. There's these famous 2011 results that have now seemed to be lost. What's up with that? And and uh, how how did how did those come to? What do we know about the 2011 testing? And and is there is there something I missed before from that testing to the yeah. 2011 we're, testing? It is. Yeah, there's a, there's a mixture of DNA okay. that that they discover um, in. Uh, the ligatures, um, which this could be why they're asking to have these tested um, because there's already a mixture that they are trying to use to muddy the waters. Um, so Stevie Branch's ligatures um, suggest there's a mixture um, and the swab from Michael Moore's private area suggests that there's a possible mixture um, and then the swab from Steve Branch's private area suggests there is a foreign allele present that does not match the victims or defendants. Um, however, I can tell you for a fact that during autopsy, um, when photographs were taken of these poor victims, um, that uh, the private area of the, of Stevie Branch was um, touched by the bare hand of one of the physicians who was doing that work. So you think more than likely that's maybe maybe the source? That could potentially be the source. Yeah, it very, very likely could potentially be the source. Okay. So after that testing, what, ha what, ha what did they do after that? Um, so... In 2011, um, when they're still trying to get out, they, they, um, so in 2010, November of 2010, they want to, um, this, the Arkansas Supreme court granted them, um, evidentiary hearing, which all the new evidence could be presented to the court. Um, so they're considering this new DNA, this mixture and all this stuff to be new evidence. So, um, they asked for more testing in March of 2011. So the it's interesting, the items that they asked to test hadn't been tested before, most of it. Um, so there's like some more hair, um, some biological extracts, which I believe is uh, like the stomach contents of Steve Branch or something. Um, their, their clothing and their shoes and uh, planks that are near the crime scene, a little sheriff's badge that Michael Moore used to wear or carry with him, a bike reflector and the bikes. And there was also an ice pick and a hook and a rope um, and sticks found at the crime scene. And then Michael Moore's wallet. And interesting, you said cigarettes, cigarette butts and packs that were found at the crime scene. Um, so I, I was really curious to see what the results were and the shoelaces they didn't ask to be dna tested they asked to have them measured and examined for fibers but they didn't mm. ask for dna testing on the shoelaces at this point which is kind of odd considering they want to do it now um and, uh, kind of odd because the fiber evidence that's so damning in this case they always said that that is junk science that's, they do that's say that that's junk science which is interesting um, so, so that's where they were at with that. And, and so the state agreed to the testing. They didn't fight them on it. And then the judge ordered the testing. Um, so that was in like April of 2011. 
So they had 90 days to get back with the court and let them know the results to have it done. And um, so they issue a status report um, mid-July, July 18th. Um, and they're, the, so the, one of the things they couldn't, they couldn't find was the white sheets that the boys were moved on. They wanted those tested, but the police couldn't locate them. Okay. Um, but they, Clearly it's a so conspiracy in the, to cover yeah. up the truth, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, and then it turned out to be papers, which they probably ended up discarding, or they probably, with all that biological matter, just. Um, were too corroded and eventually got tossed, I imagine. But um, so the lab, so by July, mid July, they completed all of the non hair DNA testing. Um, and they found in three locations on Christopher's uh, sneakers, they found um, DNA um, on the shoelace hole um, and on the, on the shoe that's, there was one shoe that still had a lace in it. Um, so on the shoelace hole of that shoe and the shoelace that was in that shoe, they found um, DNA from the same male source. And then on his other shoe, they found DNA from a different male source. Um, so, and, and they also contained the shoe, <laughs> the shoelace hole DNA hid. And the other shoe DNA hit also contain a mixture from a separate source, which they don't say if it's male or not. So, um, and it, it's just interesting because they say it conclusively excludes Eccles, Miss Kelly and Baldwin, which are the three convicted. Mm -hmm. um, they don't say um, anything else about anything test, any any of the other items that were tested. They don't say what the results are. There's no report from the lab like we got for the other testing. Um, they indicate that the shoelace and lig ligature testing is in progress. Uh -huh. And they, they actually don't even say on that status report whether or not any of the male DNA matches the victims. So... so it's like a mystery, the results. And yeah. then what happened to those? And then they pled guilty. Via, well, then they, they asked yeah, they, to plead guilty via an Alford. And then they well, said the they state had a, made them do it. Yes. They had right, a they had separate. A yeah, they had a separate status report on July 25th, which was only like 10 days later or something like that. Not even. Mm -hmm. um, and that so there, it was the hair. They were talking about the hair, which um, I think they tested 12. They tw tested 12 new hairs. Eight of them matched uh, Christopher Byers, who was one of the victims. Three of them couldn't be tested. And there was one hair from the blue jeans and blue wallet that didn't match the victims or the convicted. And so we don't, I mean, that hair could be from who knows. It could be from anybody from <laughs> any reason. I imagine the blue wallet was Velcro and I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen hair stick to Velcro, but I have to could be the killers. Yes. <laughs> could be somebody else's, right? Right. But yes, I've not been able everything. to speak to I've not been able to speak to anybody or find anybody. And I know um there's been, you know, a, a prominent podcaster. I shouldn't say prominent. Um uh <laughs> Yeah, no, we'll name him, right? Certain podcast. Yeah, Bob Ruff. <laughs> Went so down tell me there. what happened since you're really close to this whole thing with Bob Ruff. Oh. So Bob Ruff went. So we. So the nons have been screaming about this 2011 test that they've never released the results for. So they're so they're giving these status reports and they're listing things, and then all of a sudden, it gets like we're we're getting we're hearing nothing back about yes. about about this DNA. Yeah, so and I I wanted to trace they where the DNA. Guilty yeah, I was trying much. to trace. Yeah, absolutely. It's it not they they the status report the last status. So the status reports, and I want to be clear, come only from the defense. It's the defense's mm -hmm. lawyer writing the status report. So they put in the report what they want to put in the report, and and that it is what it is. It's not the report from the lab, which is what we have for all the other DNA testing that's available um, online. We have the the lab reports. 
Um, we don't have those for this for some reason. And so July 25th was their last status report. And then um, August 2nd, Eccles attorney is having lunch with his old law school buddy who's the attorney general, um, asking him to skip the evidentiary hearing, which why, if you have all this evidence that proves you're innocent, are you going to skip a hearing like that? Um, right. And so that then, would be say we have new new evidence. So that would vacate the you know evidentiary hearing to vacate the yeah. conviction. Can we go? On the basis he's like can, new evidence. Yeah. Can we go Instead right to of a, going to that hearing? They asked to plead guilty via an Alfred plea. Yeah. They well they asked to go right to a trial first, and then somehow the Alfred plea came up. So the Alfred plea is um, they're pleading guilty, but they're 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 able to say, well, we're pleading guilty, but we are actually innocent. But we believe the state has enough evidence to convict us. That's cool. what an Alfred plea is. They the they asked if they could do, they could do this, and the inexperienced with this case, I should say, uh, prosecutor at the time agreed Ellington, to it. Right, Scott yeah. Ellington, who I did contact and try to get these lab results from Scott Ellington, and I would like to say that his assistant is very sweet. She's very nice. Um, and she couldn't find them. Um, she told me we, she told me we had to look in person and Bob Ruff was going down there and he said, I'll look for you. Great. Absolutely. Get these results. I just want to see so what's in Bob them. Ruff from the truth and justice podcast, which is, I think if there's ever been a exact opposite of my podcast, I would, I would say truth and justice <laughs> is his truth and justice podcast is the exact opposite. Yeah. He does nothing but wrongful conviction cases and seems to conclude at the end of every single one of his long investigations that every single person is innocent. And exactly. it's, a, it's a little bit different than looking at cases of people who've been convicted and saying they're guilty because it's much more unlikely that the police would have it wrong. The court, the jury would have it wrong. The prosecutor would have it wrong. The appeals courts would have it wrong all up until you know the innocence project or whatever yeah. comes no up so. until bob bob ruff he's the, he's the bob only ruff. one he's the only <laughs> one that knows how to investigate anything on this planet earth uh, um, in his <laughs> mind but bob bob at the time i was on okay terms with bob and he was looking for me and they told him we must have them somewhere but we can't find them and i know that i know several other people have gone and dug through the case files and not been able to locate them. And when this new evidence was found, um, or not new evidence, when this evidence was, the lace shoelaces were found and they were going to test those, I thought, well, maybe, maybe the, the DNA is reports, the lab reports are with the evidence that came back um, from the lab. Maybe they're just thrown in there or something. And no, they weren't in there either. Um, I know people who looked and they're not there. So nobody's, I mean, I, you know, I'm just saying they got these results back and they were asking um, to skip the evidentiary hearing and to plead guilty within days, not even 10 right. days. And, and at what point, at one point, and the West Memphis Three themselves have told, especially Damien Eccles and his advocate wife, Lori Davis, have told different stories about this DNA results, where these DNA results are from 2011. Can you talk about that? Um, from what I remember, I, didn't, I don't remember if it was uh, Damien or his wife, Lori, who told him, but I, and I don't, I think it was on his Bob Ruff's podcast that that one of them said it or, or Bob Ruff told me himself, one of the, th one of those that um, one of the two of them said that they had them or the, but they just, they just didn't show anything. So right. I, and I, I've, even, I've even heard Lori has said she's that they, they Lori lost them at one point. Is that true? Or is that just that I don't, that I do not know. Okay. I, I hadn't heard that one. Okay. <laughs> But you hear so much, potentially, right? potentially, I mean, they did leave a bunch of stuff in a storage unit in like right. Arkansas or something somewhere. So potentially they check they out lost it. Men's interview with the man who inherited the or bought those books from the storage unit that 
Damien Echo. Oh yeah, like that that's a him a for that's a great interview if you can track that down. That's that, crazy. That really did. Yeah. So, so so here's the here's the 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 rest of this. Um, so they get out August 18th, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're and August 25th, Scott Ellington, who was the prosecutor at the time, gives a statement. And the quote from this statement is once I think it's Bode or Bode Labs. I don't know how to say it. I, I don't know which way they pronounce it. But once they get their reports done, the state crime lab has agreed to run those through CODIS. So to me, that indicates that the lab has not completed the reports yet and, and given them to the prosecutor. So I don't know if he ever got them. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he did and they lost it. Maybe they never gave them. Maybe they weren't obligated to since the case was already um, dismissed or vacated or because um, they had to, I think they had to um, dismiss or vacate the first sentence and then recharge them for mm. them to plead guilty. Um, That's interesting. So it was two different trials. Miss Kelly had his own trial and right. Baldwin and Eccles. Yeah. But they did all this at the same time. So they changed this. So they just gave them a new case to totally vacate it via Alfred. Is that? Is that? What I think it, I believe so. Yeah. Interesting. So it, it's it's just a technical thing or something. So I'm not sure what happened to these results. But I'll tell you this: if those results ever come back, if if anybody mm -hmm. ever gets the lab report, send them to me. <laughs> send them. To okay. Contact me. Contact Roberta. Anybody ever gets those reports, they need to be public. If you learn one, th one thing from this episode, the 2011 DNA results, we are looking for them. Send yes. them. My address is always in the about section. I'm on social media. Find me. Find Jen Carlson. We are looking for them. If you're friends with Damian Eccles um, or his wife, ask them for these results. <laughs> Because they won't give them to anybody. And um, the, Bob Ruff won't ask them for them. Um, I've asked him to. I know several other people have asked him to ask them for them. Um, he will not. Or he, he's, uh, he interviewed them in, his, in their New York apartment. He had pizza with them. He took off his shoes. Yeah, he sat there all with chummy them. with them. Very friendly with them. So yeah. not only did he get criticism for his... For people like me saying it's going to be really hard to be objective when you're sitting in someone's living room uh, eating pizza, you know, going out to pizza and uh, chatting with them to be about their guilt or innocence. Yep. But it brings up questions. Why isn't he asking Lori Davis, who really spearheaded his defense team and the raising of money? You know, Henry Rollins is on record saying Lori Davis was the one who was always calling up the celebrities and yeah. always requesting more money, saying we always we need more money. You gotta give more money. And you we you were mentioning before we started, we went live that the West Memphis Three's lawyers, most of them worked pro bono. So what was that money spent on? And I think the answer is public relations, but lots of public relations. Yet. I mean, yeah, they really set the bar. Twenty million dollars is they, what has been estimated. They made the formula for what we call innocence fraud, um, yeah. which is you know making making the convicted sympathetic, uh, make them the victim, and then you you start a PR campaign. With a um, you make a documentary that makes you look innocent. They and, they, they they streamline the formula and yep. it, and Rabia Chaudhry. Adnan Syed's advocate was inspired by West of Memphis. So that will tell you that these documentaries have wide spread effect, you know, wide. Well, like the same thing with the Avery case, that making right. a murderer convinced millions of completely rational people that Stephen Avery didn't kill the woman whose literal bones were found five feet from his bedroom window burned up. I mean, uh, just because of a documentary. So what are they asking for to be tested now? 
the the West Memphis three case, mm -hmm. they're asking for um, the MVAC testing of the ligatures. I think all of the ligatures in the case, all the shoelace ligatures. Um, and we're still waiting, I think, on, on a decision um, from the judge on that, um, whether or not it can be done. So Bob Ruff has raised, from what I understand, $100,000 or something like that to pay wow. for this test. Um, and that's the other thing. You're asking, why are they testing now? Um, it's because of Bob Ruff, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. He he pushed this and spearheaded this. And so when he's doing that, what is Damian Eccles going to say? No. How does that make him look? You know what I mean? When Bob Ruff's like, hey, we need to do this MVAC testing to, to prove your innocence. What's he going to say? No, he can't say no. Right. And he knows from 2000, if, if what we think happened in 2011 is that maybe the results could have been one of the possible scenarios is that the results could were not helpful, in fact, damning to them, they can just be swept under the rug. Exactly. I mean, they're already guilty for this crime. They have nothing to lose. So to answer the question, why would guilty people ask for the DNA? There is your answer. They have nothing to lose. Nope. And it only helps, and I'll use your expression, Jennifer, muddy the waters. Yeah, that's exactly what they're people. trying to do. They're, they're pretty sure there's going to be a bunch of DNA on these shoelaces with this M back, and they're not worried about it. So to, why do you think that they're guilty? What's the most clear and uh, convincing well, the, evidence? The most them? convincing thing for me is that I believe Jesse Miss Kelly. And I realize Jesse Miss Kelly has, has said he's, he's confessed or given nine different accounts or something like that of this story. But the main thing is there are some things in there that he could not have known that are very descriptive that he describes. He describes the boys squirming in the water. Not everybody knew that the boys had drowned, that they had water in their lungs. It wasn't completely clear. He, he knew who was hit harder he knew which boy was cut on the face. Th things he knew which one was cut in their private area. Um, and I just believe him. He's telling the story. To me, he sounds like a little kid who's saying, you know, people always say, oh, he's got the mind of a child. Well, kind of. He's got the mind of a teenager, which I'm very familiar with, by the way, because <laughs> I do have a teenage son. Um, mm -hmm. And what, he'll, what, what he's doing is he's giving a little bit and then they're like, hey, this doesn't make sense. And he's like, gives a little bit more. He's trying to give as little information as possible so that he doesn't get himself in trouble. He doesn't want, he's the only one who shows remorse. He doesn't want to um, admit what he's done. So he, it comes out very slowly and it comes out, um, he doesn't give the whole story until the end when he knows um, that he's, basically cooked you know mm -hmm. um but but that I, and i don't think that there was a satanic killing it could have been i mean i think damien eccles was obsessed with like the occult and satanic type stuff and um witchcraft and and all that stuff i don't think that's what was going on though i think it was like a a hazing type murder mm -hmm. they were out there drinking and they were decided to pick on these little boys and it went too far. And then they thought they had killed them maybe and they weren't really dead. And they're, so they were tr trying to hide. They knew they were in big trouble. So they had to hide the bodies. That's, that's what I think took place. It's just so the most logical explanation for me. Is, is that you answering the question? Do you have from Oswald Spangler? Do, do you have any disagreements with William Ramsey's uh, opinion on the West Memphis Three? Is that you answering it, saying it's not a satanic murder? I, d I don't know if it is or not. I, I, I don't know if he, he killed them in a satanic way. Or, I, I don't think he did. I think they were dabbling in stuff like that, Eccles especially. Um, and maybe they planned it, because I believe they did talk about it, about killing somebody or hurting somebody. And he liked to torture and you know animals and stuff like that and have animal skulls and everything. So um, it's potentially possible. I wouldn't rule it out, but I think it's more likely, especially for the other two, 
to be to be a Eccles is a different he's a whole different animal but the other two I think it was more of like a hazing type thing where they're beating up and picking on little kids and it goes too far so Eccles potentially because he's still obsessed with Aleister Crowley and he I mean I think I just looked at his Twitter today even though I'm blocked but I looked at his, <laughs> Me too. I looked at his Twitter today and he's got a book on there by Aleister Crowley you know, and he on the stand is saying he didn't even know who Aleister Crowley is, you know, which was a right. complete lie. So he's perjuring himself on the stand. He thinks he's smarter than everybody else. And I, to me, there's no way they didn't do it. They, this right. was an area they hung out in. It's, it's a logical area for teenagers to, and, and other people to drink and hang out and, you know, do things that they don't want to be seen doing. And it's the halfway point between where Damien and Jason and Jesse were living. It's like the the central area. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, and he's, he, I think, admitted to going back there, even though he lied and said he didn't on the stand. I think at one point he did admit to going back there. Interesting. So is there anything that would convince you that the West Memphis Three, any DNA evidence? Yeah. That so, would convince that they're innocent or anything that the West Memphis Three could present, like maybe an alibi. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah, the three don't have alibis either. That's the other thing. They they not only don't have alibis, but two of them admit to being it, were with each other, uh, Damien and Jason. But um, yeah, so if any of these DNA results come back and there's DNA on it that's from somebody who has committed a crime like this before who didn't know any of the boys um, or or something like that, somebody whose DNA had no business being there, um, I would consider that pretty good evidence against that person. I'd have to see more, like more stuff would have to come out that would connect that person. But mm -hmm. DNA that belongs to a relative being on a person's shoelace or something like that, does not mean anything. It doesn't mean they're the last person to touch a shoelace. Um, like the hair that was found, people make a big deal because the hair that was supposedly a match to Terry Hobbs was found in a knot of the ligature on Michael Moore, which isn't his son. But we don't know whose shoelace was used to tie Michael Moore because they were all mixed up. And um, so I, I was like, wow, the, there was a hair in the knot. That's interesting. So I went over to my son's shoe and I picked it up and I looked at his shoelaces and guess what was sticking out of one of his shoelaces? It was a blonde, okay. it was a blonde hair and none of my kids are blonde. So it was embedded in the shoelace. Wow. So it's potentially that hair could have been embedded in that shoelace when it was tied and it couldn't, it's possible it doesn't belong to the person who killed them. So, so does anyone else, does anyone have questions for Jen? It's, I, I think for me it's the uh, it's Miss Kelly's confessions and when I found out that when I read the confession where Dan Stidham is begging him that's his lawyer begging Jesse Miss Kelly not to confess. Yeah, that one mm. that one is the is that the Bible? That's the Bible confession. He puts his hand on a Bible right. and he's swearing to tell the truth. And his attorney is saying, don't do this, don't do this. And he's doing yeah. it anyway. This is after he's convicted, I think, right? Yeah. And he tells the whole story. Um, he tells, he knew this path to come out of the, there's a path, there's some obvious paths. So one of them is across a, a pipe bridge, which is kind of famous, but um, there's a, another path that goes up to the service drive on the opposite side. And he, they ask him how he left. He says he went up there. And um, I remember one Bob Ruff's podcast, they're saying, oh, that doesn't exist. And I'm like, it absolutely exists. Here's the picture. Here's the map that the police drew. It 100% there was a path out to the service drive, the service road. Right. And he knew that was there. And if he had never been there, he wouldn't know it was there. And the other thing, so the after the fact evidence 
that makes me think they're guilty is <laughs> is um, the fact that Miss Kelly has no contact with them at all. Um, he doesn't want anything to do with either Great. one of them. And Great. if you watch, so when they were let out on August 18th, they did a press conference right then. And I'm imploring, I think I said this the last time I was on, but everybody should go and watch. It's a very short video. I think it's like 10 to 20 minutes long or something like that. It's a press conference. The day they're released, watch Jesse Miss Kelly's body language. And you tell me <laughs> what you see because um, I see a person who is repulsed by the people that are next to him. He wants nothing to do with it. And immediately, I think one of the attorneys says like, um, what does he say? That, that da you know, he's talking about Damien is innocent and Jesse Miss Kelly almost jumps out of his seat. They almost have to physically hold him <laughs> down because he's so upset so by right. that particular statement. Um, mm -hmm. So in my opinion, he's the only one who shows any kind of remorse at all. Me too. And it's and very I, interesting. And they won't even answer any questions until Lori and the celebrities arrive. It's so managed from beginning to end. And they yep. let Jesse talk a little. And then they're like, be sh they, sort of the vibe is like, keep him quiet. They yeah. <laughs> it's like they, like, they, they look best again. Damien and Jason look terrified at what is going to come out of Jesse Miss Kelly's mouth at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could argue, well, mm -hmm. you know, he did confess, you know, nine times or whatever. And so they got convicted of this crime. So they would be, but they are afraid of what he's going to say. And I hope it, Jesse, I know he's not listening to this because he's not probably not a technical dude, but now that his father has passed away, I was hoping that Jesse Miss Kelly would come to his senses and actually let the world know what Damien and Jason are actually made of. That's why they, they work so hard to say he's feeble minded. He's, yep. he's low, low, low IQ when his IQ results showed signs of malingering. I'm going to um, answer part of this, at least from Craig R. If the West Memphis three's Alfred plea is considered a guilty plea, it is legally how are they allowed to profit with any books? Son of Sam Law should apply or UK proceeds of the Crime Act. So I don't know. I'm not familiar with the UK Crime Act, but our Son of Sam Laws were demolished thanks to Henry Hill, who wrote the book <laughs> with Nick Pileggi called Wise Guys. And that became the, the classic movie directed by Martin Scorsese, Goodfellas. And when they wanted to make Wise Guys, the book, into Goodfellas, they couldn't because of Son of Sam laws. So whoever the publisher was, it might have been Penguin, it might have been Random House, excuse me for not remembering, went and got rid of our Son of Sam laws. So we have no Son of Sam laws. Any criminal can profit off their crime in America now, which is pretty sad. In the UK, I don't know. It would be interesting to see... I'm sure they published in the UK and were like, come get us. But probably they there could be some legal action in the UK. I don't know how that 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 crime act is written, but it I would think you would have to live in the UK to do it. But if you I don't know. It would be interesting to see if you could say yeah, a little bit to, that. To to add on to that too, they they also uh, when they uh, pled guilty with this Alfred plea. They also uh, signed away their rights to sue or do anything else with uh, the state, yet here they are, what is it, uh, over 10 years later, asking for DNA testing. So they, they are not able to sue the state for a wrongful conviction because they pled guilty. Mm -hmm. they, gave, they gave up their rights. So. Right. Um, all, all rights. They signed away all rights, which a clever lawyer might be able to get around that. But Yeah. It's going to be hard, but they all seem, we were talking before we started recording about how desperate for money they all are. Can you talk a little bit about sort of where each person is? You don't have to go into super detail, but yeah, where is I'll Jesse just, Miss Kelly? Yeah, exactly. Basically, from what I know, Jess, Jesse Miss Kelly probably lives in, in a trailer park, you know, similar to where he was um, when Paradise Lost was filmed, where, where his dad lived, I should say. Um, and I think he just works for a living and, 
and you know lives in a trailer probably and um, people don't see much from him uh bob ruff went and tried to talk to him and says he talked to him but he didn't actually see him he yelled through the door or something he probably confessed again to Bob Ruff, and Bob <laughs> Ruff was probably like, oh, that's another sign of innocence. I think he asked him if he would be okay with DNA testing. I think that's what I heard on the podcast. He's like, get off my lawn, sure, yeah. just go away. <laughs> um, so Jason Baldwin, for a while he was uh, helping run, I think it's called Proclaim Justice, which was like, it was supposed to get people out of prison. <coughs> Sorry. Um, but... Uh, if you looked at their financials, their financials were really bad. And most of the money they raised was going to all of their salaries, the CEOs and Jason. Um, Jason wasn't nowhere near the highest paid one, but um, they were a nonprofit and that went under. And I remember seeing not long ago, he blocked me too, but um, <laughs> on his Twitter, he was begging for money and living in not even a trailer. It was like a, a camper. Mm -hmm. um, he Probably was living in, yeah, camper. with his cat. And he didn't even have enough money for gas. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know where he's working or what he's doing. But he's pretty much broke. And he got married and got divorced. To he did. He Holly got he, ba Ballard. Holly. Yeah. Yeah, Once Holly. More, come, he and, he come. and Holly got married. Yeah, Look Holly. Um, I, I want to hear from you, Holly. Holly has not been heard <laughs> from since lose. since Start she got talking. divorced. I think. I um, think that would be a great interview. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, I'm asking her if you're listening, come, 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 to talk to me. No, we don't have then, to agree on everything. Just tell me what happened. And then um, Damien, he's still with Lori, who he married while he was in prison. Um, they moved, I believe, originally to Salem and he didn't like that very much and they moved to New York City I, I think they're in, and and they were in New York for a while and then I want to say they're in Louisiana now or New Orleans or something like that but he's gone from um going and doing speaking tours for this on talk shows to then he was doing magic and I think he still does magic and he was like selling art at one point, his art or something. And he was selling books on how to do magic. They He did mm -hmm. some books on him and Lori's relationship. And then he did uh, a book on prison or something, maybe. He did like two books, didn't he, about that? And then he started he with his magic life books. after death. He did these two very <clears throat> published books. Uh, ghost written they feel, felt like they were ghost written life after death which is like right. so factually wacky and and untrue like he says exhibit 500 which was something the defense put together which was 500 pages of damien echo's scary mental health history that's another thing exactly that pushed me over the edge and i'm sure you into the guilty yeah uh, column or category or group or whatever you want to well, call he was, it. Well, he was receiving uh, SSI. So if that doesn't tell you he's mentally not right, I don't know what does. Um, three, three, three stays in a mental hospital in the year before this crime. Yep. So, and setting fires. Uh, fires, using he was animals, a bad killing animals. Yeah, he's like mm -hmm. every warning sign of a, a future killer um, he has. Yeah. So, and so now, then he's gone. So he's gone from that. Now he's doing some sort of karate thing. Um, but he's, mm -hmm. a, to, as far as I can tell, he's never held a real job. Which is part of their probation. They were all supposed to hold a real job. Yeah. Not be around anyone with guns. They've yep. all broken it. Jesse Miss Kelly's gotten in trouble with yep. his driving without a license, I believe, and recklessly. Yeah. And, so, and, th and nothing was ever done. No. Nope. So they are now, I think they're completely off probation or parole. It's and they're really just interesting. Afraid. Have you seen that traffic stop with Leonard Cure who, who got, got killed by the police officer because he attacked the police in a traffic stop? He was supposed to be an exoneree. He worked Ooh, for the Georgia Innocence that. Project. But if I'll, I'll show it to you. But he gets out of the car and he says something like, I'm blah, blah, blah. Who are you? And it's like some made up 
name. I don't know what he's talking about. He may be out to lunch or it may be some kind of slang. I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about because it's not like he says, I'm Leonard Cure. Who are you? But it's like he gets out like, I'm an exoneree. I can do anything with this word exoneree, which just means that you got out by legal, legal technicality, fraud, or some, some other way, by opinion. Very so seldom is that about innocence when of these people who are called exonerated. But he gets out with like kind of like this real, it just reminded me of the West Memphis Three, this kind of license to do anything. Nobody's going to stop me. I can drive 100 miles an hour down the freeway. No one's yep. going to stop me with this exonerate label, label. So I think we've 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 done it. Does anybody before we go? I don't think I missed any questions. Good, thank you. Good questions, guys. I mean, Jennifer really knows everything about not only just the case but the lore around the case. I think what the most surprising thing has been watching the West Memphis Three supporters argue from the time when I was with them and I thought they were innocent, they're arguing that Damien Eccles was just into Wicca. He was never into witchcraft or Crowley or anything like that. You guys have satanic panic. They would laugh at you, argue to their blue in the face. And now that Damien Eccles has gotten out and has done nothing but work for the occult, sell books about the occult, et cetera, et cetera, now their argument seems to be it doesn't matter and that doesn't make him a killer. Yep. That's always been moving the, most the goal amazing course. thing to watch. <laughs> I know, always. You can't win with these people. Mm -hmm. So it is that now it just doesn't matter. But when it hugely mattered, he was Wicca. So it, I think it's pretty it's interesting the way the sort of the arguments have changed, the suspects have changed so much. They've gone from accusing one stepfather to another stepfather. And yet they still have their supporters. It's amazing. And a lot of them, a lot of them. Yeah. I can guarantee you, I, I will almost guarantee you that after um, we're done with this live um, and the more and more people who listen to it, um, that I will get attacked, um, not physically, hopefully, um, but but people will, will send me messages and search me out and try and destroy my life which is what they always do, um, yet they never succeed. But um, they, they do that to all of us. They try and personally attack everybody, and they can't, you know, they can't argue the facts of the case. They just have to attack you. Um, so I'm hoping that doesn't happen, you know, and I'm willing to say that I am open to the fact that they could be innocent, and, and I'm... If you have the DNA report that can prove it, <laughs> send it to me, please, because I will look at it. I will. I 100% will. So so get West Memphis Three supporters. Find those 2011 DNA results and uh, get them to us pronto. Um, if you're in tight I, with Damien, ask him. Because he won't speak to me. <laughs> so I really appreciate So what Jen's saying is she does this at no benefit to herself. You know, uh, there's really no benefit for her speaking up. And uh, I really appreciate that you bravely do and that you took the time to learn so much about this case. Thank you so much for, for sharing your impressive knowledge with us. Oh, thank you. Um, we'll have to do it again sometime for sure. For sure. All right. Um, before I go, I did a a show with Lisa O'Brien on her Based in Fact, a true crime podcast about the DeFeo case and Amneville horror. It is very long and very extensive. It's everything you wanted to know about the, that Amneville horror. You can find it on her podcast coming up. Um, there's going to be more stuff in my Patreon. Please, if you're listening on podcast, please leave me a five-star review. Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. And I may be doing a stream on the Charlie Adelson trial, maybe tonight, if not tonight, very soon. So stay tuned for that. Have a good night, everybody. And thank you so much, Jennifer.